The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. At the end of the last class, I mentioned that uh, this invasion of the end brain by visual pathways, uh, we know that mostly it, uh, even though there was a direct pathway, it was very small, the one through the genital body, very small early on. Major roots into the end brain came, they began at the tectum, also the pretectal area, which projected into thalamic areas which then projected to the end brain. And so I'm asking, I asked there at the end of the class, what, what were the adaptive advantages of that? Why would it invade the end brain? Uh, and first I, I try to give an anatomical answer. It was a, it's a way to provide better information to the striatum. Remember, visual information could reach the striatum uh, directly from the older thalamus. But those structures weren't precisely topographic, you know, and the striatum wasn't a structure that made really good topography as easy to form in evolution. Now, that's my interpretation. Obviously, it, that happened mostly in the cortex. In the cortex, you, you, you get this highly topographic mapping of the visual world. And those pathways came by way of the midbrain and directly from the geniculate body. So that enabled a lot better acuity uh, for the learning that the end brain was capable of, especially by means of its pathways to where? Two different places. To the striatum for habit learning and to the hippocampal formation for learning about where locations of the animal in the environment. Not the locations of other animals. The location of the an animal whose brain we're talking about. Okay. So the cognitive functions were that route to the hippocampus for place information is a major part of our cognitive ability, our memory formation. But also another kind of memory, it provided a visual work route to the amygdala, which is really part of the striatum in the way I see it. Sort of a, at least a sort of a caudal output to the striatum. It functions like a striatum for the learning of avoidance and approach. Okay. And then also binocular vision, which we won't talk very much about now, but that was important too because the neocortex made, made possible a lot better binocular vision by especially stereopsis. Slight difference in the visual image from the two eyes because the information from right eye and left eye is kept separate all the way up to the cortex. Where then you can combine that information and get depth. At the end of that Chapter 20, I mentioned, I believe it's in Chapter 20, I mentioned some of the expansions and specializations of the visual system. Mainly, midbrain tectum and the thalamocortical projections of the visual system. The midbrain tectum, these are the two major structures, and we're going to look at that today. Uh, just one second here. And we'll be talking a lot more about transcortical pathways in the following class. And then I don't deal in the book with the tremendous differences in, among animals in retinas. You develop many retinal specializations. In animals, you don't need larger eyes just to get a larger retina and get more retinal ganglion cells and more acuity that way. What else do you need large eyes for? Bring in more light. Why do you buy a camera with a big lens rather than a small lens? Brings in more light. Okay. If you want to get a camera that can take pictures in very dim light, get a camera with a very large lens opening. 
like f 1.8 or something like that. It will take in a lot of light. Okay, question. Excellent question. We, we, we know that animals with forward-looking eyes, they're usually predators, and primates, and primates are usually predators too, but not all of them. Some of them who have fruit-gathering primates, but they also need good binocular vision, so they have forward-facing eyes too. Uh, but what about the animals with these eyes that, like the, the hamster? It's got eyes that look 60 degrees out and 30 degrees up in the horizon. That's the way their eyes look. That's the natural position of the eyes. I've measured it in the hamster. But it's pretty similar in other little rodents. But they do have an area of binocular vision. There's about at least 30 degree overlap. Okay, And in that central area, which the center of it is 30 degrees above, they do have binocular vision, okay? And they but it's pretty rudimentary compared to the primates. And also they don't have the high acuity that primates have. But it's still important for them. But I've looked at hamster behavior a lot and they they really things five feet or even two feet and thirty feet away. They don't discriminate very well, you know. But for things near them, they definitely can judge vision. They won't leap. Sometimes they do, but usually they won't jump into places that are too dangerous because they're too high. They can see the depth well enough. It doesn't mean stereopsis cues, though. It could just be the... the uh, Various other cues, like when they move their head, the parallax that you get. Uh, there's various cues to depth that if you study sensation and perception class here at MIT, you'll learn about multiple different, different various cues for depth. Okay, that don't involve stereopsis. All right. So now we want to look at the retinal projections. It's a pattern you find in all the mammals. And I should add that it's really similar in all of the vertebrates. Okay? This is the picture I showed in the last class. Of the sort of a cartoon of the optic the main optic tract and the accessory optic tract here. Just show it. So now we want to look at a little more detail of the layout of that system. From suprachiasmatic nucleus to the two geniculate nuclei, pretectal region where there's several nuclei where they terminate, superior colliculus. So we'll look at the retinal projection in vertebrates, the layout of the optic tract, and we'll look at them in several different ways of looking at it. We'll talk about species differences in relative size of structures, because qualitatively they all have the same basic layout, but there are large species differences in relative sizes, as well as in the eyes are different too. So you have different different amount, different levels of acuity and vision are possible in these different species. We'll look a little bit at the at architectural differences, especially in the genicular body and in the optic tectum. So we'll look at lamination in the midbrain tectum. We'll also look at lamination in the genicular body. And finally, we'll look at topography. And I know when you first get all this, you get a little overwhelmed by all the structures and everything. So I'm not asking you to memorize the topography, but I want you to see. I will present it to you in a way that does make it pretty easy to learn. Okay?
And these are the questions I put in the list of questions that I put online for you. These are things we've dealt with before, these two questions. Let's just see if any of you have an idea about this. First of all, what's the first structure reached by the axons from the retinal ganglion cells? Ganglion cells project through the nerve. We start calling it the tract when it joins with the rest of the diencephala. So what's the first structure? Exactly. Suprachiasmatic nucleus, right above the crossing of the axons. It's got to be the first one. It's part of the hypothalamus, definitely. Okay. The area in front of that region we call preoptic area of the hypothalamus because it's in front of the optic eyes. Actually, we talk about the anterior hypothalamic nucleus and then the preoptic nucleus. <laughs> so, I modify my first statement a little bit. So the forebrain subdivision you've just named, it's the hypothalamus. And the major terminal nucleus in that subdivision is the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Now remember, there, there's some spillover there too uh, that I showed you last time. It does project a bit to immediately adjoining parts of the hypothalamus. But we know most about that suprachiasmatic nucleus. Very little known about the functions of the sparse projections. People tend to think that they don't play any major roles. That's why they're so sparse. Uh, I'm not convinced of that. Uh, they could play important roles. You, uh, but the one thing that makes me doubt it a little bit is just that there's variability. When I study the retinal projections in a number of different hamsters. I do get differences in these very sparse projections. Some animals I see more, some I see less, but they're always there. Okay. Okay, the next question is what's the major difference in the nature of the projections of the dorsal thalamus on the one hand and the ventral thalamus or the epithalamus? That is, after you go past the suprachiasmatic nucleus, the axons go up the side of the diencephalon and they reach the subthalamus, just above the hypothalamus. Then they reach the dorsal thalamus. Then they reach the epithalamus, the pretectal nuclei in the epithalamus. So there's a big difference, though, in the nature of the projections of the dorsal thalamus and those other groups. What is that difference? Exactly. Biggest difference is what she just said. The dorsal thalamus and all the major cell groups, the, 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 at least the neothalamus, the more recent, but we think we, of the dorsal thalamus, like the lateral geniculate body, but the same thing holds true for the ventral nucleus, medial dorsal nucleus, uh, medial geniculate body. It projects to cortex, okay? Mainly to neocortex. It goes to the end brain. Some neurons, some axons will have collaterals in the striatum on their way to the end brain, but the major projection is to the end brain. Those other structures, subthalamus and epithalamus, don't project to the end brain. I mean, there were reports, you know, that they do, but Modern techniques have never been able to verify that. They don't project to neocortex. In fact, besides some ascending projections, they have a lot of descending projections. Okay? So that's the major difference. Okay, now, I last time I mentioned the epithalamus as a caudal most diencephalic segment, or neuromere. It includes cell groups where the optic tract has dense terminations. So again, what do we call those areas of termination? 
we call them by we call them certain nuclei depending on where they are. They're in front of the tectum, so we call them pretectum. Okay, it does. They are rather different. These different groups, and they have different functions. But we lump them together because they're all in that same region. We call them the pretectal nuclei. Okay, so this is two ways to look at. It. Don't worry, I'll blow these up. But here's the cross section of the level through the diencephalon. This is actually behind the optic chiasm. But you see the optic tract covering most of the diencephalon or tween brain at this level. The pretectum up here, dorsal thalamus with the lateral geniculate nucleus right there. Here's the subthalamus with the ventral nucleus of the geniculate body there. There's hypothalamus. This is behind the optic eyes. And the optic tract, see, goes, covers all these. That's why that area is sometimes called optic valves, just because the axons of the optic tract cover it. And then these are the subdivisions written as the names for their, the neuromeres. Now we know hypothalamus is actually two or three different neuromeres. And then we call this the ventral thalamus. Then in the adult, we call it subthalamus. Then the dorsal thalamus. Then the epithalamus. Okay, but now, there's another way to look at the track that I use for teaching purposes, but I think it's very useful. I just take the track all the way from the suprachiasmatic nucleus all the way to the tectum. Just stretch it out. Okay? So you see, the retina would be way off here to the left. Off the screen there to the left. There's the suprachiasmatic nucleus. It's more commonly abbreviated SCN. Here we call it just SCH, but could be done either way. And then I just follow the accents, straighten out the tract, okay? And I show what happens to them. The longest ones make it to the superior colliculus, where they no longer travel mainly at the surface. The rest of the tract is mainly at the surface. There are some that travel internally. We call that the internal optic tract, but there's smaller numbers of axons that do that. The main ones travel to the surface, except when they get to the superior colliculus. Actually, they do travel to the surface of the colliculus early in development, when they first get there. So then how do they end up down below those superficial layers? What has to happen? They're on the surface, and then they're not with further development. Either the axons that were on the surface have to die off, or the cells in the colliculus migrate up through them. They're still migrating when this tract is forming. And the latter interpretation appears to be true. Because you do see cell migrations going up to the superficial gray, occurring after the first axons have reached there. And when you look with stains that are capable of seeing degeneration occurring, you don't see a lot of degeneration. Okay, so we think it's, it's actually due to the cell migration. Okay, now, here you see them. It looks like they're branching off. Let, let's do it this way. Here's that first picture again, where I blow it up. It's the same thing, and I point out here, ventral thalamus is not the ventral nucleus of the dorsal thalamus. It's really subthalamus, okay? The ventral nucleus is this nucleus right up in here, part of the dorsal thalamus. So here I just show the places the optic tract terminates. You see the dorsal part of the lateral geniculate body. Now remember, this is a rodent, the LP is not huge, but it's the rest of the lateral thalamus. Besides the genicular bodies, you have lateral thalamic nuclei. The, the medial geniculate is another lateral thalamic nucleus. Uh, here is a human. Twelve weeks post-conception. Okay? So a three-month human fetus. There's the rodent 
adult. Here's the human fetus. The adult human thalamus doesn't look like this at all. Okay? I just want to point out that it's really the same as the rodent. In fact, the embryo looks very similar. Okay? But then it changes. Why? Anybody figure that out? What happens to the human thalamus development after that first three months of life? The brain of a three-month human fetus is pretty similar to a hamster just after birth. But then something continues developing in the hamster, in, in both the hamster and human, but mostly in human, after that first three months. That means, by the way, the hamster at the human at three months post conception is like an early postnatal hamster. And the hamster is born in the 16th day of gestation. Just to give you some times. But anyway, what happens? This nucleus, labeled NL here, the lateral nucleus, nucleus lateralis, this is the posterior part of nucleus lateralis. Okay? That grows and grows and grows. And in primates, it really gets huge and we change its name. We call only part of it the lateral posterior nucleus, like we call the whole thing in rodents. The rest of it we call the pulvinar, which means pillow. The pillow, because it's bulging out so much. Because the cortex it projects to, even though it's there real early, it expands so much. And thalamus, you know, a lot of people that talk about cortex just think the sensory input comes to it, then you go from one region to the other in the cortex, then you go out through the motor cortex. Not a very good accurate picture, even though the majority of people in this building think like that. That's not really a good picture of the connections of the cortex. So we'll be dealing with that, including some next next class, but we'll continue dealing with it for the other systems. All right. So that's what happens. Otherwise this this at this stage, these pictures are pretty similar. Okay. And remember those Divisions here happen because here an even earlier, very early embryo, embryo, where I show a side view with the segments. Remember the seven rhombomeres here, and then a little segment we call the isthmus, and then the midbrain, which is a pretty big segment, and then the epithalamus with the pretectal forming area forming here, the venula forming here, and then dorsal thalamus ventral thalamus or subthalamus, hypothalamus, which is actually, turns out to be several subdivisions. Okay. So then these are the questions we want to answer now. I want you to be able to name the five main optic tract termination areas in the order they're reached by the optic tract. So here they are. They're already past the suprachiasmatic. Then you have the two geniculate bodies. Then they get to the pretectal area here. I show them on this picture. And then finally they, they turn caudally and they get to the spirit clicklus. So those are the areas. One, suprachiasmatic. Two, three, four, and then five superior clicklus. And then I ask what additional areas receive sparse retinal projections. Well, I already talked about some in, uh, near the suprachiasmatic nucleus, but there's some other sparse projections in the thalamus that are somewhat variable from animal to animal, at least among the hamsters that I've studied. I suspect it's true of other species too. And that would be projections to the LP nucleus here. Okay? So... And there are other little projections near the main projections that 
are also a little bit variable. And then I say inputs from the right and left eyes terminate in different areas. A separation that's especially important for creating binocular disparity cues for depth, for perceiving depth, visually visual objects. So describe the appearance of the distinct areas in the diencephalon of a small rodent and of a monkey. So here we're talking about the layers in the geniculi body. So in this picture, that stretched out optic tract, I show that. So there's the suprachiasmatic. And then they reach the subthalamus. This is the lateral geniculin body, ventral portion. Often abbreviated just LGV. And it's also abbreviated LGN, B, <laughs> lateral geniculin nucleus, ventral part. But notice here, these are accents from the contralateral eye that I'm drawing. I show a little area separated here by the dashed lines in both the ventral and dorsal geniculi bodies where those accents don't go. They don't go there because they're getting input from the other eye. Okay? It's a laminated structure. Not so obvious in the rodent, but when you go to other animals, like here's a four-layered geniculi body, which you find in some species, then you find that the contralateral eye is projecting to the outermost, the layer nearest the optic tract, then it skips a layer, and then it projects to the next layer, and then not to the last layer. So it projects to one and three, not to two and four. And then in primates like the monkeys, not all primates, but at least monkeys and uh, apes and humans, you have six layers. Sometimes you see seven in some parts of the Usually we number six. Number them as six. So we'll see that. Then the axons go through and over the LP, lateral posterior nucleus. That is the rest of the lateral thalamus. That part that grows so big in humans. And I show a few terminations there. It's somewhat variable, but they are there. They're sparse terminations. Okay? Again, we don't know what those do. Maybe we don't need to know because those same neurons where those sparse projections occur get very heavy visual input. But coming from the colliculus. Not directly from the retina. One of the ideas about how the genicular body appeared was just that. These sparse scattered projections that if some reduction of the colliculus occurred, they just sprouted more there. And that was adaptive to have a shorter route to the cortex. So the genicular body evolved. But be that as it may be, the next structure then is the pretectal area and then finally superior colliculus or optic tectum. But for mammals, we usually use the term spirit colliculus. All right. So let's look at the geniculate body now. We'll look at animals, you know, with this kind of layer, but even more. The, here's the geniculate body of a monkey. It's similar to a picture, a color picture I took from Hubel, David Hubel. Uh, and from a book that he has online that anybody can download. Very nice book. Unfortunately, David died just recently, uh, but he was a very productive visual neuroscientist who did many studies of both cat and monkey uh, genital stride system, working mostly in the visual cortex. He did the work with Torsten Riesel, who's Retired now, but it's been had a position at Rockefeller University for the last quite a few years after he left Harvard from his work with Hubel. But here it shows you how they number these. Uh, oh, yeah. How, where does this horseshoe shape come from? That's not what I'm showing here. Can you figure that out? 
Let's go back to the embryo. It looked like this. Monkey's the same. This structure here grew and grew and grew. So this structure got pushed this way. Okay? So, and the pulvinar, in growing so big, uh, Oh, the thalamus in front of it also grew. And so, this thing that's on the side of the thalamus here, let me get it here, side of the thalamus got pushed over like that and it also get, got rotated. So, the genicular body ends up on the back of the thalamus. So, it goes that way and gets, so this becomes like that. And the optic tract, which was out here, is now under here. Okay, so that means this is the optic tract surface. Those are the axons. The tissue is torn off there. But that's where the optic tract is. But it's exactly top, topologically, it's the same as this, this picture here. And then you have, you see the way they number them. They always start numbering them nearest the optic tract. So one, two, notice the first two layers are larger cells. And then the smaller cell layers or parvocellular layers are three, four, five, and six. And again, you have half of them that are getting ipsilateral, in, uh, contralateral input and the other half are getting ipsilateral. Almost always the contralateral eye is projecting to the surface layer and to the last layer here and to one of these middle layers. Okay. It varies a little bit among species. Here's a human, and then this is a human that, uh, a picture that was donated to me by a former student who developed a silver stain that stains cell bodies. Gives you a very high contrast picture. This happens to be from a human case who had a pathology of one eye. So the cells in the of the eye that gets ipsilateral projections, the cells uh, have shriveled a bit. Okay, so this is one of the magnocellular layers here. And then here's the other contralateral layer and the last contralateral layer. And these are the layers getting ipsilateral projections. Most of the other magnocellular layer we don't see here. Okay, all of these cells here are all parts of that lateral thalamus, the pulvinar nucleus, and there's a small part of it they call the the part that's an inferior pulvinar, pulvinar is similar to LP of the rodent. And often they do name an LP too, but it's the homology is not always that clear. Okay. So, this is a picture from a very famous uh, neuroanatomist in the early part of the 20th century, LeGros Clark, who didn't have access to beautiful optics for taking low power pictures and all that. So, he drew them. And he drew these beautiful pictures, in this case, of many different uh, primates. And at that time, they thought the tree shrew might be the most primitive primate. It turns out to be similar to very primitive primates, but it's actually an insectivore. But you see the different patterns of lamination that occur in these different animals. Okay, they don't all have identical structures. Okay, binocular separation, the anatomy underlying that binocular separation in the brain has evolved differently in different animals. In these pictures, the, the old world monkey, the guinon, is, is most similar to the human. This picture, this picture here is fairly close in level to that picture of the, of the photograph. 
Okay, so now I want to go to the rodent, which they're usually using in laboratory work uh, for a lot of the studies of many systems. And uh, I want to use side views, and I show the op here. Here's a very simplified picture of it. The outline here is a fairly accurate view, a side view of the upper brain stem of a hamster. So you see the inferior colliculus and superior colliculus of the midbrain here. This is all thalamus. The dorsal thalamus would be all through here. But the geniculate body here, way out at the edge, here's the two parts, dorsal and ventral nuclei. Now remember, I showed you, I said that the lateral, the ventral nucleus, the lateral geniculate is really subthalamus. Well, most of the sub, remember, it's a curved structure, so this is at the lateral edge, so it's much higher up. But then as we went deeper into the thalamus, it would be way down here. Okay. And what I show here is a little schematic of one little bundle of optic tract axons coming from the chiasm. Up the side, I don't show the terminations in the suprachiasmatic nucleus because those are different axons. But I show that axons that go to the geniculate body are usually branches of optic tract axons that go further. They go to the tectum and often the pretectum as well. I also show where the major input to the LP that provides the LP with visual information doesn't come from the retina, even though there are a few projections there, they come from the superficial or visual layers of the sphere colliculus. And it projects to both LP and to the outer layer of the lateral, the ventral nucleus of the lateral geniculate body. So then, uh, I, here's the question that I want to answer next. The, there are axons that leave the main optic tract and terminate in these small cell groups. There's up to three of them. They're described as what kind of optic tract? The word is accessory optic tract. And this is an anatomical reconstruction of the hamster uh, where I had labeled the axons, all of the axons, that I could, which is most of them. So I get the entire optic tract and I, I put together, ser this is done from serial sections. So, you know, the sections were actually like this, but pretty close together, okay? And I then reconstructed the entire optic tract from chiasm to colliculus. In this particular brain, with the, I was using degenerating X stains for degeneration. I didn't get a good picture of the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So, like most scientists, I never lie with the data I present. I don't show it. Okay. But in fact, with other techniques, I could see it. And it's right here. All right. And what I'm showing here is the accessory optic tract axon. And you can see why they're called accessory optic tract. They leave that main tract that goes all the way from chiasm to colliculus here. Here's some that leave just below the cerebral peduncle. And they travel caudally and they terminate medial to the peduncle. Right there to a nucleus that sort of hugs the medial side of the, of the substantia nigra and the cerebral peduncle. And others do just travel caudally below the thalamus here. They just sort of peel off at the level of the ventral lateral geniculate body. And they terminate in a little nucleus here. And some axons go down this way and get to this other way. There's even some axons going in the other direction. That's called the transpeduncular tract. And then finally, here's a little tract that goes from the Pretectal area that leaves the main tract seems to go down to the lateral terminal nucleus, but it has another little nucleus there, way out at the lateral edge of the pretectal area. 
So that's the la accessory optic tract. Very interesting system because all the cells in that tract respond to movement of the whole scene across the retina. No matter where you are in the retina, you can be, the cells will detect movement in the same direction. So when does that happen? When the whole animal starts to fall, it happens when the animal's locomoting, and so there's streaming of the visual world past his eyes. And it functions as a kind of, it does the same kind of functions that the vestibular system does. Okay? But it gives visual signals to indicate changes in head direction and eye direction. Okay? Very important for uh, locomotion and very important if you need to keep track of your of head position. All right. So then I just want to show you that, that what that reconstruction uh, is doing by taking photographs of a similar brain. Now here I didn't label it. Here I did. So here you can see, because of the way I shaped the light, you can see major tracks because they're whiter. That's the lateral olfactory tract. There's the optic tract. There's a pathway carrying auditory input from hindbrain up to the inferior colliculus. There's the bundle. One of, you see these two bundles here? We cut those when we remove the cerebellum. Those are the cerebellar peduncles. Okay? There's hypothalamus down below. And there's where I... Uh, when I removed the brain, I tore the pituitary off right there. Okay? That would be the mammillary bodies at the caudal end of the hypothalamus. So here I've labeled them, and I've labeled a few other structures. So this structure here is not thalamus. It's part of the end brain. It's the corpus triatum. And I show you exactly where the geniculate body is. I know you say, well, how, what do you mean exactly? Because I can see the shadows there. I can see them there. I know that that's exactly the edge of the dorsal nucleus. And this is the ventral nucleus, right below it. There's the optic tract, hypothalamus. This big bundle here that emerges from behind the optic tract, those axons are coursing through the corpus striatum here, but in the rodent they're all they're all separated. There's a whole bunch of little separate bundles that collect and form the peduncle. It comes along the side of the diencephalon and then passes right on into the pontine region here. And then when we study auditory system we'll learn that this is called the lateral lemniscus. And that bump right there behind the cerebellar peduncles it's the cochlear nucleus. And there's the stump of the eighth nerve right there. So you, one way is to, to learn this stuff is to you know, study reconstructions like this, look at these photographs, and try to learn to pick out the structures. Right now, you should be able, this is midbrain, you should know what the colliculi are. You should know the optic tract and the hypothalamus. Here, if I've already told you I've removed the hemispheres and the cerebellum, then you know this has got to be below the hemispheres, and there's only one big structure like that, it's corpus striatum. Okay. So one way is to cover those up, and uh, in the book you can it's done so you can just put a piece of paper and still see the lines for the labels. Okay? I want you to do that in your book. Cover up the labels and see if you can learn them. Learn what these structures are on this kind of picture. Uh, this kind of picture and this kind of reconstruction were very important to me from a lot, for a lot of the experiments I did because I needed to do neurosurgery where I would open up the brain. Of course, I would only see a small part but I learned the landmarks so well that I could open it up 
and also using blood vessels, I could see these structures and see the boundaries. That way I could make injections or even lesions in just small regions. All right, this is another somewhat easier view where I have the adult brain on the left and the brain of a newborn on the right. And here I've just labeled major parts of the brain. The factory bulb, the cortex, the superior colliculi, inferior colliculi, cerebellum, and the medulla oblongata, the caudal part of the hindbrain. The rational part of the hindbrain is underneath the cerebellum. The cerebellum is part of it. But what I want you to note here, look at the cerebellum here in the baby. It's just this tiny little collar behind the inferior colliculus. It's mainly developing with huge numbers of cell migrations from the rhombic lift of the hindbrain. Just developing in the newborn hamster. It's born, remember, at a stage, it's like a two and a half to three month human fetus. Which means that a two and a half month human fetus looks just like this too. The cerebellum grows mostly after that time. Okay, so one way to study that, just use the book and Make yourself a card and cover those up and make sure you know what all those pointers are pointing towards. This one should be the easiest. This one will be a little harder. All right. Can somebody tell me what E is? Optic crack. And what about what about D? Hypothalamus. Uh, can anybody do C? <laughs> Pad, right. <laughs> cerebral, cerebral peduncle. Pad means cerebral. It's always, <laughs> it's, it's always the abbreviation for cerebral peduncle is P-E-D. And I didn't label the pons, but this would be the pons right there. This is the trapezoid body, which I don't name. Cochlear nucleus. Cerebellar peduncles. And lateral meniscus. But I just labeled the ones here that, you know, we might put a, a diagram like this. We wouldn't put all those things, but we might ask you to do a, give you a bunch of terms and say, well, which one goes with each of these letters, you know. So if you're at least familiar with it, you would be able to do that. Okay. And then here, the same thing. Here I've covered up. Just name them off for me. What's that? What's this? Okay. Or cerebral hemisphere. Either one would be proper. What's that? Okay. Notice most of it's Exposed here. Here only part of it's exposed. And in most animals with an even bigger bigger hemisphere, you don't even see the membrane from a dorsal view like that. Okay, and this one? Cerebellum. This? Caudal hindbrain or medulla oblongata. Okay. Oh, I'm asking you another question here about naming these structures. I said, what would make this more difficult during a neurosurgical procedure? Think about it. In a neurosurgical procedure, you don't expose such a huge amount of the brain. You only can, you know, you want to make as small a window as possible so you don't damage so much tissue. So that's the first problem. And the second thing is, there's a lot of blood vessels. In fact, you have to be very careful not to go through any really big ones. Because you'll get so much bleeding that you'll be spending all your time stopping the bleeding. And you do spend a lot of time doing that in neurosurgery. Although now we have a method to apply that does stop 
the bleeding of all the smaller vessels. Just not the huge ones. Okay. Look at these other pictures for next time and just see if you can figure out what's exposed. Okay? I use different lights, uh, lighting, just so you... This is that same kind of brain stem that you see here with the hemispheres removed. And you can see various structures. Here I've done a little more removal up front here. Let's see if you can figure out what those things are. Now, I do name a lot of them in the book. I don't think I show all these pictures in the book. But you, I wanted you to see how by... You adjust the light a little bit. You can actually see boundaries. Like, look at this one. There's the spherical colliculus. There's the pre -tectin. You look at this one, even clearer. There's the boundary between spirit colliculus and pre -tectum. And look at how clear this boundary is. And this one. pre area, LP, geniculate body. That is the bundle carrying information from the amygdala, which we will be studying soon. Okay, and this just shows what it looks like in a, the embryo when it just the accents are first grown back to the tectum. A very straight pathway back to the tectum. Uh, and we'll, next time we will start in this area and talk about the midbrain a little more. Just to look at these pictures, but they're in the book. Uh, we'll give you a chance to ask about them. And uh, we'll go through some of these before we go on to the end break. Okay?